All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the May 21st, 2018 regular meeting of the Edina School Board. I'm gonna call the meeting to order. We do have a quorum. Uh, we're gonna start with our traditional run through of the agenda. So since the last uh, school board meeting, we've had uh, work sessions uh, in uh, April 16th, and uh, they're all up on the, all up on the screen. Uh, um, May 3rd, May 7th, and May 8th, uh, May 14th, and uh, just had a closed session on some negotiations prior to this meeting. Uh, tonight's meeting is to, um, we're going to uh, approve minutes, of course. Uh, we have several items on consent. Um, it's that time of the year. Um, reports and discussions. We have a discussion on secondary math materials adoption, also graduation requirements. The board's going to discuss their 2018-2019 school board goals. Um, some policy updates um, at that time of the year on um, taking action on leaves and um, purchase of buses and other purchases for next school year, and then we'll approve other policies. So with that, um, a rundown of the evening. Great. Thank you very much. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the April 9th regular meeting, the April 16th work session, the May 3rd work session, the May 7th special meeting, the May 8th closed and special meeting, and the May 14th closed meeting. So, so moved. Seconded. And are there any changes to the minutes? I think there were a couple of corrections to the it's May. Sorry. Yep. Any other corrections? Uh, all right. All in favor of approving the minutes of April 9th, April 16th, May 3rd, May 7th, May 8th, May 14th, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next is hearing from members of the audience. We do welcome community input. In the event you wish to speak, we ask that you sign up in advance of the meeting and that you do limit your presentation to three minutes. Also, we would request that you not make any personal comments about individuals in the event you have a complaint about a particular person, uh, that you bring that to the superintendent's attention. We typically do not have discussion about issues that are raised at the seven o'clock meeting. We do arrange for a 6.30 for those who would like to have more of a discussion, and we do also welcome emails. So we're gonna start, and I think the first person is Tom Connell. Welcome. Did you approve the agenda already? Good evening, Board Chair Wallen Friedman, Superintendent Schultz, and members of the school board. I'm speaking you, to you tonight about um, a resolution that will be read into the record after um, I give you my perspective on it. I'm here tonight to ask that you publicly reaffirm our commitment to serve every child in the community. You have, we will have before you a resolution to do, to do just that. Aside from the obvious benefits of showing your support for your teachers, when you adopt this resolution, you would also be sending a message, a very important message, to our students, family, and the larger community. All for All is the framework on which we build our instructional strategies. All for All is the framework on which we build our relationships with our students and our families. We want you to reaffirm to us that the work we are doing is the right work. We want you to reaffirm that you support us in doing this work. We want you to reaffirm to the community that we are doing the right work. As you can see, the many teachers in attendance tonight are here because they are deeply concerned about what appears to be an erosion of the school board and district's trust and support for our teachers. Teaching is hard enough as it is, and no educator should be attacked for doing their job. Right now, you are asking teachers to do the impossible. Open their email before school, potentially be told that someone hates them for doing their job, and expect that teacher to be emotionally grounded and deal with their students. I doubt there is a single parent in our community or anywhere else that would find this learning environment acceptable for their child. The community of Edina continues to embrace the all for all mission and a commitment to academic excellence through organizations like the Edina Education Fund, Edina Give and Go, the Meal Fund, and just over a year ago, the city of Edina started the Race and Equity Project. We feel strongly 
that it is time for all of us to find a way forward. This past year has been intense, emotional, ugly, and at times profoundly disillusioning for many of us. Our teachers still have faith in who we are and what we do. By adopting this resolution as written, you will be saying that we stand together in our commitment to serve every child every day. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to have a couple members uh, read this resolution into the record. Okay. Good evening, school board. Uh, Peggy Wernis, Normandale, second grade. Krista Smedstead, Normandale, second grade teacher. Edina School Board Resolution reaffirming commitment to all for all plan and strategic direction. Whereas the mission of the Edina Public Schools, ISD 273, working in partnership with the community is to educate all individuals to be responsible lifelong learners who possess the skills, knowledge, creativity, sense of self-worth, self -worth, and ethical values necessary to thrive in a rapidly changing culturally diverse global society, and whereas following an intensive strategic planning and revision process involving community members and school staff, the Edina School Board unanimously adopted the All for All Plan in 2013 with the goal of closing opportunity and achievement gaps based on race and income. And whereas the All for All Plan was updated in June of 2014, to include a statement on racial equity and cultural competence in the Edina Public Schools, which includes the commitment of looking at all district work and initiatives through a lens of racial equity so that all students will have the skills, opportunities, and access to experiences that will lead them to help reach their full potential and achieve ac academic success. And? Whereas? Since the adoption of the All for All plan, the district has made strides in closing opportunity and achievement gaps based on race and income, including, but not limited to increases in participation in advanced placement classes by students of color. And whereas, we reject claims that the district's commitment to equity comes at the expense of academic excellence. And whereas, individual teachers employed by the district have experienced intense public criticism, hostility, and threats because of their work in support of the district's equity mission and have at times felt concerned for their physical safety. And whereas the Edina School Board remains committed to the academic success of all students, which requires ensuring that all students have a safe and welcoming learning environment and all staff have a safe and supportive working, working environment. Now, therefore, the School Board of Edina School District reaffirms its support for the All for All plan and statement on racial equity and cultural competence. Thank you. Do you have a copy you could bring up? So, on behalf of the board, I will accept this and, and we will add this to the board's discussion. It, it is not yet on tonight's agenda and so it will likely come for discussion at a subsequent meeting or work session. Thank you very much. Next is David Frankel. Oh, there he is. Hi, it's David Frankel, and just here to reinforce an email you may have received last night from me regarding school safety. I don't think I need to discuss what happened last Friday in Santa Fe, Texas, but just to reinforce the fact that five of the last six mass shootings have occurred, the perpetrators have been students. All the safety procedures you're putting into place, there is no cookie cutter and there is no straightforward attempt to stop these kinds of shootings. Unfortunately, as I put in my email, all these shootings are stopped by law enforcement. And the quicker law enforcement can get to the perpetrator, the fewer the victims there are. It's been proven time and time again. What's also happening is perpetrators are evolving. There's no common thread to a lot of these shootings. 
The only common thread is there's typically carnage. What I'm asking in the email, and since the mayor and other elected representatives are here, we need more law enforcement making a presence at all Edina schools. There's no reason they can't be making a presence in Mark's police cars and with officers in Mark uniforms. One of the tragedies that may come out of the Santa Fe shootings, with all the talk of having teachers have weapons, which I'm totally opposed to, is some students may have been killed in the crossfire with the perpetrator between police and the shooter. What's also unusual is the shooter actually shot a policeman, which has never happened before in the United States in a school. So things are evolving. Perpetrator also planted bombs, or a single bomb, even though it wouldn't have detonated, is another escalation of what shooters are doing. They're also pulling fire alarms, which happened in Florida, which made everybody come out of their classrooms and made it a shooting gallery. So what I'm saying is this is evolving, there's no cookie cutter, and we need help from the police. They're the only ones that are going to be able to stop these types of events, unfortunately. I don't like talking about this, but it's a reality we all live in. And it, unfortunately, we hope it never happens again. But if anything, it's escalating. As the newspapers have pointed out, there have been more children killed in shootings this year than there's been members of the armed forces killed in combat. So it's something we definitely have to take a look at. And I would like to have the city of Edina have more of a police presence at all of our schools. We have two school resource officers for nine schools. And the high school has a full-time one, but the other schools, they're all soft targets. They're all susceptible to anybody doing something we don't want happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Janie Shaw. Welcome. Good evening and thank you for allowing me this time to speak. As most of you know, my name is Janie Shaw and I am the parent of two Edina Public School students. I wanted to take this opportunity to first and foremost thank each of you for the time, energy, dedication, and heart that you put into serving on our school board. Many of your evenings are spent away from places like the family dinner table, the hockey rink or ball field, the choir, band, or orchestra performance, or even simply the good night book or evening conversation with a loved one. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving up those things for the good of all the kids in our district. You play such an important role in what makes Edina a great community. I also want to thank each and every teacher, staff member, and volunteer in our district for making the 2017-18 school year so great for our kids. They are second to none in their dedication and passion for what they do every day. This year has not been easy for many, but I hope we can all look at it as an opportunity to grow. As parents and adults, I believe strongly that we have a responsibility to our kids to model the type of behaviors we want to see from them. Sometimes that means sacrificing our comfort to show courage, recognizing that everyone makes mistakes, understanding that we are all coming from a place of good intentions and simply trying to do the best we can. Finding a way to offer grace where it doesn't naturally come is no easy task, but realize that it is through failure and mistakes that change, growth, innovation, and greatness are truly born. My hope is that all parents and adults will acknowledge and appreciate that our teachers spend every day creating a safe place for our kids to try, fail, and keep trying until they succeed in their own ways. As a parent, I want nothing more than for my child to feel like they are the center of the universe, and I know I'm not alone in that. But school is the place where my kids will learn that they are actually a small, but very important and unique square in the patchwork of our society. By teaching them that in life, we are constantly faced with views that will differ from our own, our teachers give them the tools and a safe environment to practice listening with respect, discussing with consideration, and existing with compromise, which will open doors for them for a lifetime. Our Edina teachers are teaching our kids how to learn, and that is the greatest gift they can give. Many people from both within our community and elsewhere have been critical of our schools recently. To those people, I say, remember that we are more alike than we are different. 
For the sake of our kids, it is vital that we set aside any personal grievances or misconceptions and come together to have honest conversations about mending this fractured spirit. Time, money, and energy have been spent to try to divide this great community, and the fact that our schools have been put at the center of this is nothing short of sad. Our schools are more than rankings and test scores. Our schools are more than sound bites in a news story or social media post. Our schools are certainly more than fodder for political marketing. Our schools are the living and breathing heart of this great community and our connection to the future. We can all do better. If you want to see change, it's not enough to just say it. It's not enough to post about it on social media. It's not enough to complain to your neighbor. I urge people to use that time to share coffee with someone whom you don't agree with and find common ground and compromise. Use the time to come to the table with real solutions and actively contribute to change. Anyone who's volunteered in our schools has not only seen the greatness in our staff and students, but has no doubt felt it in their hearts. We are Edina, and we are all great. Thank you. Thank you. So that does conclude the uh, hearing from members of the audience. We do have a number of recognitions of staff. I'm going to read through here. There we have a recognition of Susan Prather. Um, she has organized so many things within Concord that have made a positive difference in so many ways. She's made a big difference in hundreds of kids' and parents' lives in a very short amount of time. She is truly a great leader in person. The next commendation is for Barb Asselson and Tim Colvin, who are bus drivers for Creek Valley Elementary. Um, the comments there, they appreciate what a wonderful job the Edina bus drivers do. Barb Asselson was a driver for four years for this particular family. Her positive attitude, cheerfulness, smile, she truly cares for her kids. Uh, Tim Colvin has become a favorite of the kids. He has a gentle personality and treats all kids with respect. Students return that respect. The bottom line is we feel dressed, blessed to have such a great transportation department. The next commendation is for Daniel Molick, Orchestra Director of Valley View. Daniel Molick recently served as a cooperating teacher for one of an education students. This person wrote to let us know that Mr. Mollick was an outstanding mentor for the student. He gave quality feedback, was incredibly supportive. He is a dedicated professional who has devoted his career to improving the quality of student lives through music. We have a commendation from Kathy Powers, who is grade five teacher, Cornelia. Um, she's received an MFA in creative writing, which is emblematic of the level of education our diner teachers receive. Uh, this particular parent had a child that was in GT reading, and the teacher took great effort to make sure that her classroom work also was excellent. The last combination is for Kip Dooley, Media Specialist, Highlands Elementary. The person who wrote in said, her presence makes a difference every single day. She shows students by example what kindness and respect do for her community. She also helped with the beloved news show. She provides guidance and shows kids they can create and produce something as a team from start to final product. And we do thank all of our teachers. Uh, I do want to thank everybody that spoke tonight and everybody that's in the audience. Before we continue in our meeting, I have a few comments I would like to make. So my comments tonight are prompted by events that took place on Tuesday, May 8th and the days that followed. As many of you are aware, the school board met on the evening of May 8th to review complaints that have been brought against one of our members. We met that night consistent with our policies that require the board to review the complaints we receive. While there are demands that the school board open the meetings to the public, the school board did not have the authority under state law to open the meetings that pertain to the complaint against the member. Under state law, when a complaint is filed, it's the subject of the complaint that gets to decide if the discussion of the complaint will be in a closed or open meeting. In this case, the person about whom the complaints were made chose to keep the meeting closed. Unfortunately, Individuals who were present that night made threats against board members. In addition to threats made that night directly to board members, there were also threats posted on Facebook that evening and on the next day. I bring up these threats because I want to emphasize that it is unacceptable for people to make threats against anyone. It does not matter if we don't agree on an issue. We should utilize that disagreement to engage in a civil discussion of the pros and cons of each side to reach the best possible decision. 
Regardless of the process or the decision, no person should have to endure threats for their safety. That evening and the days that followed have caused me to reflect on ev events from last fall. Last fall, a number of our teachers received threats against them. And I'm gonna take a moment to read a couple examples. And they, they are highly edited because of the language. But one of our teachers was sent an email that states, you really need to do society a favor and kill yourself. The email ends by saying, why don't you go play in traffic and do the world a favor? The same teacher received an email that contained a multi-paragraph rant against that teacher filled with profanity. At the end of the rant, the text sent to the teacher states, I will do what it takes to get you fired. Other individuals who posted, other individuals' posts were forwarded to the teacher, saying the entire staff of that school and the school board should all be fired, or shot was posted by another. The last post in the sequence said, always remember, educators have to walk to their cars too, just saying. Regardless of whether you disagree with something that happened in the classroom, our teachers do not deserve to be threatened. Our teachers spend countless hours working on behalf of the kids in our district. They do so under the direction and the guidance of the board and our administration, and they have earned and deserve our respect. When our teachers were threatened last fall, the board was remiss in failing to speak out against these threats. Tonight, I apologize to our teachers for failing to make a public stand for them last fall when they were threatened. I also reaffirm my support for them and the work they do. We are a successful school district. Our kids graduate from Edina High School prepared to succeed in whatever is their next venture. Nonetheless, we're not perfect. In that regard, it's appropriate to ask questions if you have concerns regarding something that happens in the classroom or a decision by our administrators or the board. Questions are good. Multiple points of view, and multiple perspectives are good. Debate helps us improve as a district. Constructive questions and civil respectful discussion is essential within our district. Threats, intimidation, and bullying, whether on the internet, shouted from the hallways, or in meetings, are unacceptable for adults who are role models for our children. We want to remain a school district of choice for our community, for our teachers, and for our students. Thank you. Now we return to our regularly scheduled board meeting. <laughs> so the next item is the consent agenda. Are there items that we want to remove, that anyone wants to remove from the consent agenda? Um, I wanted to move the fee schedule to action. So this is H? Yes. So 4H is now removed and will show up as action as action item F. And Chair Wallen Friedman, we're going to take uh, trial based learning experiences off the consent for a future meeting. We want to make sure that those are vetted appropriately through policy. So I think I would entertain a motion to table travel based learning experiences. Can I get a motion to table travel based learning experiences? So moved. Second. Uh, any questions? All in favor of tabling travel based learning experiences, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. So travel based is off of the consent and will come back at a different meeting as opposed to fees which was off the consent and will come back as an action item. So next we have reports and discussion. Um, Randy Smazel, math. And Mark. Oh, good idea. So thank you, Sarah. So I do need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. I get a second? Second. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Now we're on to reports and discussion. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, Margo. Good evening. Um, Chair Wallen Freeman, Superintendent Schultz, school board members, community members, and fellow teachers. 
We are very excited to present to you this evening a little bit of work that has been happening around our secondary math adoption. And uh, sitting up here tonight, we have Keisha Dockin sitting next to me, who is a mathematics teacher at Southview Middle School, teaching primarily seventh grade. We also have Mark Carlson, who is our teacher on special assignment for mathematics. And this is Mark's first official school board presentation. And he is very excited about the robust audience that we have <laughs> here this evening. We also have, uh, sitting to the right of Mark, uh, Mr. Scott Lenz, who has been an incredible math teacher in our district for a long time, teaching advanced algebra and AP stats over at the high school. And we have our fabulous Jennifer Hurt, who is over at Valley View Middle School and is teaching sixth grade mathematics. So we uh, welcome them and thank them for their time this evening and for being a part of our presentation, adding to the depth of that. So mathematics is following our curriculum review cycle. Um, it's also following the adoption of math and focus materials at the elementary level. We've been working on that adoption at the elementary level these past couple of years, and now we are in full implementation this next year. And it is time to do the rest of the mathematics adoption. So we're, we're following that with the secondary level. Typically, what happens in that process will include a review of the mathematics best practices, looking at the research, reviewing the mathematics standards, uh, developing criteria then to assess the available materials that are, that are out on the market that are utilized for teaching those standards. Our mathematics team, as Mark will describe in a few minutes then, gets to look at those materials, dig into those materials, try those materials in classrooms with teachers and students across the district. We examine those materials very carefully against the criteria, try to narrow down a couple of the top choices, maybe pilot some of those materials, collect feedback from the students, feedback from the teachers that are using those, and then eventually complete the selection process for recommendation. What we are bringing forward this evening is a recommendation regarding the math materials that we would like to purchase for Edina Public Schools. Uh, this presentation this evening is for discussion. There's no uh, action needed this evening, but we will be coming back to you on June 18th for action regarding this proposal. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mark Carlson to give us a little bit of depth and detail about this proposal that we're bringing forward tonight. Is this one up? Yeah. Um, okay, if you could go to the next slide. Do I have control? Of no, okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the rationale for looking at a change. Um, we adopted the University of Chicago Secondary Math Program originally in 1996. We're currently using the 2008 version. So this version is, is written really prior to the standards that we are currently operating at, under in uh, math here in Minnesota. Um, we know that they are... Um, they are not perfectly aligned to the standards, especially in the geometry course, which has been kind of a weak strand for us. So one of the, the reasons for the change is, is to really get some materials that are better aligned to the Minnesota standards. These uh, materials also lack uh, resources just from their age. They're, they're, there's not a whole lot of secondary resources available to teachers to use with students. There's very little uh, online access, there's really just a PDF version of, of the textbook that's available. Um, because these are written prior to the standards, we've had, uh, teachers have had to create a lot of auxiliary lessons to help students meet those standards. And in doing that, we really have kind of a lack of consistency across buildings. And that's another reason for uh, wanting to make some changes. A little bit about the process that we uh, used in terms of uh, um, looking at uh, materials. We, we developed a committee of five high school teachers and four middle school teachers. Uh, we developed a rubric of criteria that we were interested in. We were, we were interested in the, the content, pedagogy, assessments, organization, and tech support materials that were available. As we looked at the material, uh, one of the first things we were really looking for is how well was it aligned to the Minnesota math standards? 
We're looking for the uh, NCTM or the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics process standards to be embedded along with the eight mathematical practices from Common Core. We looked at about 12 different sets of materials uh, in this process and in doing so, uh, we decided that we were interested in um, we were interested in looking at three of the, the, the sets of materials. The first one was Eureka Math, and Eureka Math is a, uh, based on the Engage New York materials, uh, which was designed in New York from a nonprofit to, to hit the New York standards and eventually the Common Core standards. We examined the idea of uh, taking math and focused. Uh, we currently are now using it in K through five and seeing if we wanted to take that to sixth and seventh grade. It is a K-8 program, but the eighth grade, uh, in terms of meeting the standards at the eighth grade level for algebra, we didn't feel like it was well suited for that. The third one that we looked at was the Envision product. It's a product put out by Pearson. It's Envision Math 6-8 and then Envision AGA with a consistency of authors throughout the whole program. Okay. As a committee, after looking at these three in the classroom setting and having further discussions about them and, and resources from uh, surveys, uh, decided that our recommendation would be to purchase the Envision Math series, both the AGA and uh, 6-8 Math. Some of the things that we liked about the um, Envision series was we really felt like it was a, a strong, coherent, rigorous program. Uh, we felt like there was every lesson there was a, a strong look at where where had had that topic been, and how are we going to use it after we're done with it. So there was that real real strong consistency throughout the program. Um, of all the materials that we looked at, we felt like this was best aligned to the Minnesota standards. Um, we really liked that it had a really good balanced um, pedagogical approach, um, which is really consistent with what we're seeing with math and focus in the K-5 level as well, where we're, it's not just about process, it's not just about conceptual, but really that all three legs of the stool, so to speak, the con deep conceptual understanding for students, uh, procedural fluency, and applying those in new and novel ways. We also liked, similar to the way we like math and focus from a K-5 level, is the, the uh, fact that problem solving is really at the heart of what, what's happening with the Envision product as well. Um, there's high, high interest, accessible activities for all students. Mathematical modeling and discussions are inherent within the whole program. The last two here, critique and construction of mathematical arguments and the exploration and drawing conclusions through reasoning, we really felt like that was well uh, throughout the whole program and really is going to help us with geometry. One of the hardest things for students in geometry is the ability to do proofs and it really is embedded throughout the whole program, this, this um, critiquing and making arguments um, and having uh, drawing conclusions and reasoning. So we really like that aspect of it. I talked a little bit about the um, uh, a little bit about the the pedagogical approach, and I said that we kind of could take it from conceptual to application. And I just wanted to kind of give you a general example of that. So, so for instance, they'll take a topic, and you, the idea is to start with what you know. We know students know at this point that they know how to find the area of a rectangle. Now we're looking at how do we find the area of a parallelogram. Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to relate those two topics. Everything will start with a visual of some kind. We know, just like we did with Math and Focus, the more that we can visualize things for students, the better off they're going to be. So even the idea of, I know Jennifer used this particular lesson in class, even having kids cut these out and make the rectangle from the parallelogram, all of that is kind of embedded as part of it. If you want to go to the next slide then. And then once we do that, now we're going to try and relate it so we can say, hey, how is that formula for area of a rectangle related to the formula for the area of parallelogram, starting to move from that just conceptual to procedural. So we can start developing a procedural understanding of that relationship. Do you want to go to the next one there? <laughs> <laughs> 
Now we're going to start trying to work towards that procedural fluency. And here's something that, I, that we really liked is the idea that, hey, although we're working through some procedural fluency, we're still interested in having discussions about how do you know for sure that's the case, getting them to think about their thinking. And, and, and that's, that process is really important as students are, are learning more about uh, the mathematics that, that, that we're trying to teach them. And then, and then finally applying those in word problem situations is, is kind of the final step of, of that process. Now, um, some, of those, some of the other things that we really uh, liked about the Envision product is uh, there's just, just a wealth of support materials for our underserved uh, students, also for our students who are, are ready to go deeper and extend the, those concepts. We have multitude of opportunities for them to do that. Uh, there's, for every unit of study, there's a, a pre-assessment uh, which allows us to kind of produce personalized learning pathways towards being ready to learn those new topics. Um, throughout the book, there are STEM activities um, where students will get an opportunity to focus on real social, economic, and, and environmental problems that are, uh, are multi-lesson um, uh, activities. There's also something called three-act mathematical modeling, which is a somewhat new concept. This is the first... Um, uh, series where it, it's embedded within the, the series and it's really kind of designed to to take mathematical modeling and, and relate it to like a three-act play giving students kind of just a little bit of information to start doing making their own questions so you can start seeing a different depth of knowledge so students who are maybe on just on the surface of this can take a surface level questions where if students who are much ready to go deeper can take that information a little deeper and and can question a little bit deeper then they'll, they'll work through problems, ask questions, ask for more information that the teachers can provide. And then finally, there's the reveal, kind of the end, the climax of the movie, so to speak, of how do you get the answer, and then look for sequels. What else could we do with this? So all of that's kind of embedded within the program as we go along. There's a, a tremendous amount of online supports, video tutorials, instant feedback, uh, adaptive assignments, are all within the program. There's also interactive digital resources that we have available, including uh, interactive calculators use, using uh, Desmos as a power engine for that, which is an online graphing calculator, allowing us to see how, if we move a graph, how that might change tables and equations, et cetera. So seeing those relationships in real time. Now the materials that we're requesting are materials for our, our standards bearing courses or our required courses for math. We still have a strong, rich math program beyond the standards. We have a number of students who are, who have uh, really have reached the standards fairly early in their, in their high school career and, and have an opportunity to take very extensive courses uh, from pre-calculus to calculus AB, BC, multivariable calculus, AP statistics, et cetera. So we have a, a really a great, rich depth uh, of, of math courses at Edina High School. Finally, in terms of next steps with the program, we're looking to uh, have training for our teachers prior to the start of the 18-19 school year. We were, look, we're looking to do a phased implementation uh, as I said, geometry is kind of an area that we feel is, is needs showing up right away, so that's kind of was our starting point. So geometry would be uh, the main course that we would start with along with a number of the middle school courses and eventually over the next three years, uh, everything through an Algebra two level course would have these materials um, as their um, main materials. Thank you for your consideration. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to try and answer them. Yes. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, just as an example, how would you have taught that parallelogram to rectangle example today without these resources? Would you be cutting paper? Would you be using chalk? Would you be using imagination? Just how does no chalk. No chalk. <laughs> You'd have trouble finding chalk right now. And, um, oh, now you made me forget. 
Um, there's this great math tools that is interactive with, for the students. Um, so they would get on this math tools, they would draw out this parallelogram, they were able to cut it on the side of the triangle and actually take that and move it over. And so then you see that relationship of that base times the height where it actually becomes the base where you can see the, you know, the parallel um, lines that are that base as well as the height which is that perpendicular line to the um, base too. So it was really, I mean the kids loved it. They wanted to do it like you know 20 times with the same kinds of parallelograms, but different um, measurements too. So it was very interactive and I thought the kids really enjoyed it. I have a quick question. Um, when you shift curriculums across multiple grades, what do you look for for success measurements? Is it um, student achievement? Is it how do you know after year one, year two, like? yes, this is what we thought it was going to be and is improving our math. So I think we're going to have to look at multiple measures on that. We'll be looking at, uh, we'll be watching map data, we'll be looking at MCA data, we'll be looking at in-class assessments to see how students are doing on those. We'll be developing common assessments along the way as well and kind of keeping track of how students are doing that and how we maybe need to make adjustments throughout, which is kind of a, a consistent ongoing process um, across the board. I have a question. Does this have any implications for gifted and talented? Implications in terms of would they be having these same materials? Exactly that. Yes, yes they would. They, most gifted and talented students would just be one or two years ahead and they would just be going through this at a, at a faster rate, so to speak. Using the same materials? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The level of rigor in the materials is very high. Is it? Could, could you um, tell me what, how you see the transition between fifth grade with a different math curriculum and then sixth grade, moving into Envision Math, how, how is it that you're going to make sure that that's a smooth transition? So one of the things that we looked at as we were looking at all the different curriculums is we, we knew that we had already made the decision to go to the Math and Focus, and we wanted to make sure. So if we looked at all three of the ones that we kind of tested in the classroom, all three of them we felt like we had a, we, we're not gonna have a problem making that transition. Um, there's, there's some some real strong correlations as I tried to pull up, point out um, in terms of pedagogy, in terms of things like bar modeling, which, which our, our second through fifth graders are learning right now. Uh, th that's still in integrated in the sixth and seventh grade curriculum as well. So a lot of the same concepts, the same approaches, the visual learning, all of that is kind of, is, 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 is still here in the secondary program along with the K-5 program. And I can kind of speak to how that um, came out in my experience piloting the curriculum. So I piloted it with my seventh graders. And um, the connection to the visuals and the connection to just the, the modeling that it has in the program is very strong. I think students, as they get older, become kind of afraid of the math. And they think, I, can, I have to put what's in my brain on the paper. And if I don't do it right or draw it right or write it right, I'm going to get the whole thing wrong. And the, strength of this program that I found was the visuals and the modeling and the immediate feedback that some of the online tools provided to the kids so they could see you know if they were on the right track or not or make one little tweak and then get back on track um, and that was provided through um, at least the online piece was um, in a couple of different ways there were videos that the students could watch so after they left our classroom and they had other questions, they could go on and watch a video made by the program. And I've made videos before too, and you know, they're so-so. But the, the <laughs> videos that they have in this program are very strong, um, and go back to the visual kind of modeling there. And then the other piece of the support that the kids have is through kind of a question help um, sequence when they're doing the online homework. So if they get stuck on something, they get immediate support and redirection as opposed to waiting 24 or 48 hours to come back to me and try to remember to ask at that point when it happened two days ago. So um, that was another kind of strong piece that I found when I was piloting. 
So we talked, we had a really great discussion around this and teaching and learning. Oh. oh, I was just going to add. Sorry. I did both of the pilots. So I teach sixth grade. I teach pre, um, primarily pre-algebra, but also algebra in sixth grade. And um, I piloted both math and focus as well as in vision. So I really got a feel for both of them. I thought that was really important. As we do make that transition, we want that transition to go smoothly from fifth to sixth and so we have had that thing to think about I think um, forever because we want that transition to go very smoothly. Math and focus is a great job of higher level thinking skills which is something that we want those kids to come in with in sixth grade. Um, when they come in with those ideas though I think there's a different mindset in sixth grade in advanced level classes in middle school math preparing ourselves for pre-algebra it, the level of math is a little bit more challenging. And sometimes kids are going home, um, they may not get math support. They might not be able to find it. And so you have to find resources online. And some of them aren't always reliable. Some of them are hard to understand. Um, the resources that we have accessible for kids uh, through Envision um, have been really helpful. My kids have really enjoyed doing the online homework. Uh, they love that it doesn't just let them get it wrong and excuse them from it. It makes them think about the questions, think about how they could approach the question differently. It makes them do it three times before it gives them uh, or let them kind of off the hook. Um, there are several different resources that they have accessible online. They have um, videos that they can watch. They have math tools that they can use. Um, they're those hands-on kinds of things um, that are accessible for them for every single homework assignment that you give them to them. To them. So um, along with that, they um, offer, I was going to say, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're a little bit older. It takes longer. Um, <laughs> okay, I lost my train of thought. But um, I guess my students have really enjoyed having the online piece, especially at home. Um, they can work through it on their own. It gives them, and, and the, the questions kind of get harder. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, if they get the question wrong three times, it gives them a different question just like it. So they can't just kind of keep trying the same numbers over and over again. It mm -hmm. makes them think again, makes them think all about different numbers that they have to use and how they can approach that problem differently. Jennifer, I was going to ask you, I don't know if you're groping for the term manipulatives, and I think I've heard that in some cases dyslexic students uh, and some others will find it helpful to actually have things to touch and count rather than just abstractions. Is that part of the thrust of Envision, um, or is that you, you were just mentioning it, is it, or is it kind of a tangent? As far as manipulatives and sitting in front of them, is that what mm -hmm. you're speaking of? Um, n there aren't, I don't think they're never going away. We, um, yeah. we use them in advanced algebra at the high school. We use them downstream in lower grades and we always will because it's very important. The tactile experience is, is obviously something that's important for all learners. The online pieces though are, you know, for example, I did um, a surface area uh, lesson where surface area is kind of this you know, three-dimensional thing, and the kids took this net and they um, transformed it. And they, it pulls it apart for them, and then they have to create this net that is then going to fold up to see if it works. So it was this online manipulative mm -hmm. for them as well. And again, it's something that they don't have to be in a classroom, or if they miss it because they're absent or they're, you know, for illness or whatever, they have it accessible for them at home too. So I think that piece is really nice as well. Another thing I noticed in the packet that you gave us is, and I was excited about this, is that you're trying to make the language more accessible for our EL students. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is there any data behind that? Well, there's, there's, there's glossaries. I believe it's 10 different glossaries that, Multiple languages. 10 different languages of glossaries that are there, uh, w w which is, really nice because students who are maybe a second language student 
we can we can utilize those to to help with not just in the English version, but they can they can it's more accessible to them in their own language as well. Okay. We do have the benefit. We do have the benefit in math of symbolic representation, which is universal. So, I mean, to the extent that we're not dealing with natural language in the work that's being done, <coughs> which is at least some of the time, the symbolic representation is always good. I just want to express my support for this change. I know it's a lot of money for a curriculum, but really it's, it's important to equip our teachers with something that's coherent across grade levels, across ability levels, and it's, it's really exciting and inspiring. I think it's also very responsive to, to changes both in our students and how we teach to recognizing some of the, the weaker strands uh, through the tests and trying to, to shore them up. It's just uh, a very good proposal. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is graduation requirements. Randy, you are our presenter. I do not have uh, slides here for you this evening, but there is a report that um, um, pulls together much of the information that has been discussed across several board work sessions in the last month. And just to kind of give you a quick overview, part of the discussions have been around the graduation credit requirements for social studies, the uh, implementation of the capstone as a graduation credit requirement, and then the um, examination of physical education and the requirements for physical education. And uh, the, the dialogue this evening is for discussion. Uh, we're not asking for action at this time. We will seek action at the June 18th school board meeting. Um, in terms of the recommendations that are in the report, and let's go to social studies to begin with, part of the dialogue has been around um, the evolution of the social studies conversation. So a few years ago when we started to plan the transition of ninth grade to the high school, it was an opportunity for the department to look at the impact that that could have. And prior to the 18-19 school year, economics was taught in ninth grade and it was a full year course. So when you looked at the data of our students and their social studies course taking data, about 92% of our students were taking four years of social studies in that schedule. Now as we moved ninth grade to the high school, one of the things that we also did is we took a look at econ and we felt that as a upper grade level course that that course could be taught in a semester. And so that course was condensed to a semester course and we also looked at the human geography standards and noted that they needed to be strengthened in the social studies um, course sequence. So one of the proposals at that time was to look at adding a human geography course as one way to address those standards. As the schedule at the high school became more refined, we saw as that continued to play out that we do have a number of kids who participate uh, in six courses with that seventh course being a student prep. And there's lots of great reasons for that, but one of the impacts of that is that it does pinch the schedule down slightly for students across their four years. So um, as that began to be implemented, I believe our board had requested to revisit the graduation credit requirements that had been pro proposed around social studies. And through the April 2nd and April 16th conversations with our board, uh, two work session discussions. We had our Andy Beaton, our high school principal, had visited um, at least one of those, and we did talk about capstone with a couple of our capstone teachers over at the high school, and some of our physical education teachers joined us as well through those dialogues. And the recommendation around social studies is to return that graduation credit credit requirement from eight to seven credits, which it was previous to 2018-19. The um, eight graduation credit requirement was in place for one year, but hasn't technically been implemented in the course sequence yet. And so at this time, the recommendation is to move it from eight back to seven credits, which was the previous, again, the previous requirement. For capstone, 
the discussion has been around uh, moving the implementation of capstone back one year. So it would become effective for the graduating class of 2022, which is this year's eighth grade students. Uh, the whole purpose of Capstone is to provide an authentic opportunity for students to demonstrate how they've achieved the educational competencies in a unique and meaningful way. Part of the original dialogue around Capstone was to um, change the senior year to continue to grow its level of engagement and excitement for the students and also have some very authentic, unique learning experiences offered during that senior year. And then our third conversation was around physical education. And as the board knows, there's, there are new physical education standards that are um, now published from Minnesota Department of Education. We've asked Minnesota Department of Ed to create a matrix for us, cross-referencing the old standards with the new standards. We do not yet have that tool, but it's something that is going to be developed. We will probably have to develop it ourselves internally ahead of their time schedule because uh, we want to examine that more deeply this, this summer. Um, there are several pilots that are occurring around physical education at the high school level where they are honoring the types of sports and activities that many students are participating outside of school and then offering some flexibility in how students demonstrate other competencies that are not yet met in physical education. And so it's really an opportunity to be more flexible with how students demonstrate and earn that competency in physical education. So as those pilots uh, continue through the end of the year, uh, we'll also hopefully have some additional data around the impact of those. And our plan is to bring back a recommendation next fall regarding the new physical education standards and what those would look like in a course sequence for physical education in Edina moving forward. So at this time, the, again, the summary of the recommendations are to return the social studies credits from eight to seven, to move the capstone implementation back one year so it would be for a graduating class of 2022 or current earth, eighth graders, not earth graders. And then um, the physical education will, is on pause and will be reviewed in a more in-depth way coming next fall after some work that occurs this summer with some of our staff. Those are the recommendations as I'm bringing them forward. I will entertain any questions you have. Um, we've been talking about this as a board for quite a while, and I know we had in-depth discussions in teaching and learning as well as as a board. Um, and a lot of this, is, you know, obviously is around the high school, you know, that 9-12 experience and wanting our kids to be able to access everything that they want to access because we have so many incredible programs that they can partake in. And we have a lot of high flyers and high achievers who are taking the four cores. They often, they're in possibly a music. And then of course we have a lot of kids who stay in world language all the way through 12th grade. So that often uh, takes up their six slots as it were for that 9-12 experience. And so we've been debating, you know, how do we help to allow kids to make those choices themselves, but also encourage them to take the courses that we believe should be part of that, that Edina education. So uh, with the social studies, we did go back and forth, and hopefully we, now we will embed those geography credits, um, which then allows kids to take other social study options that, that last year. Um, and as for the capstone, there's possibility of still looking at a couple other courses, which we haven't implemented yet, um, that would allow kids in their 10th grade and senior year to have a pathway for capstone, which we don't have implemented yet. So the current 9th graders wouldn't have, who would be 10th graders next year, wouldn't have access to one of those classes. So that's why as a board, we really felt it was important to give it a little bit more time so that these kids all have an equal pathway of choices to get to that capstone. And back with Fayed, it's, it's, it's the, the discussion that we've had for so long around there's two Fayed credits that we require and a health credit that we require to graduate high school, <coughs> although the state doesn't require um, any of those credits at this point. But the state is also uh, sharing with us some new information about standards that they would like our kids to meet. So again, it goes back to where do we direct students to choose classes on their own and when, where do we say, no, we want you to take these classes. So the board said because of those changes, we definitely want to wait on that 
and consider that as we go uh, further into the future. But I think there's still, there was in-depth discussion even with those new standards coming out, how we want kids to meet those. Can there be a way of combining some of the health concepts with, with the physical education concepts? Does it have to be three credits or three slots? Um, all of those things need to be considered as we allow our kids to, to make different choices in their, their high school career. Any other questions, Erica? Yeah, um, it's sort of tangential. Tan tangential. Yeah, tangential, thank you. Um, at the end of eighth grade, if you're at Valley View versus South View, you, at South View, you do a capstone-like project at the end of um, eighth grade, and you're, if you're at Valley View, you don't. So my question is, for the transition into high school, if we're going to ask ninth if capstone is going to be part of the high school career and we want all ninth graders to be at the same level and have the same experience i guess my question is twofold is the eighth grade project at southview a building block for what we're doing in the high school um and if if it if it's not should it be and then my second question is, then are the students at Valley View missing out on um, experience that's going to help them um, transition into whatever the high school is doing from a capstone perspective, whether it's uh, research skills or, or something like that. I, I think it's, from my perspective, it's important that um, if we are going to be offering this type of project and experience at the high school, that we have our kids coming into the high school have similar um, backgrounds and experiences. So I was just wondering your take on that. So I think at Southview they call it Capstone and in Valley View they actually have a project but it's more of an integrated project. So they maybe have a different title for it so there's possibly a little confusion around that. So certainly we are always looking for the parallel structures across our middle schools that are part of the student experience regardless of which school you go to and that is a critical structure moving forward. We have had dialogue across our secondary principles about the opportunity to continue to align that parallel structure so that these kinds of experiences can be part of the continuum and preparation for the kinds of experiences they get access to at the high school. I believe the capstone is new this year at, at yes. Southview. Yes. It's, it's, Correct. It's in its infancy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, first I want to honor the, uh, the effort of the prior board and the work of those who uh, looked into the capstone. Uh, graduation requirement, but I actually want to revisit it. Um, I'd like to look at it during the strategic planning process to see if this is the direction that the district wants to continue to move forward in. And the reason, uh, my main reason is that um, we are increasingly hearing that our students are stressed out by the um, requirements that they're currently held to, um, and that if many of our students are taking um, math, English, social studies, a second language, music, and science, that's six, that's a full schedule. Um, and on top of that, we have the other requirements for health and um, PE and there is just no room in the schedule for one more. And, um, and I'm, I'd like to con consider how to embed, either embed the uh, authentic learning opportunities that you're talking about within the schedule, but or um, give other opportunities to students, but to certainly not add to this requirements um, so that's my, uh, uh, my take on this. If it's a great idea, students will do it as an option, but to require it doesn't seem to be, it will make students possibly give up something that they really do have a passion for. So. 
I'll just add to that. I think that's that's worth reflecting on, and I think that's part of, from our public discussions previously, part of why we're backing it off for the ninth graders to make sure that if there's a course that could take up a slot, that students have that option from early on. And if it's embedded, that teachers have a little more time to figure out how that could look. Because there are, uh, we've had our, our science staff say that they're excited that this could be something where students can go deeper in science. And it's, it's embedded in that sense. You find a strand that you already like, and you essentially have some structure around how to go deeper instead of asking the teacher um, something that seems like it's off the wall. You mind if I, if I go deeper here? You mind if I stay after and do something that's, that's outside of the norm? And instead it's, would you mind if, if we partner up for this capstone? But I don't think there's enough structure around that, and that's part of the reasons we've backed off this. And I think that the overall discussion of stress is one that needs to be a lens we look at a lot of our changes with, and a lot of our discussions around what school is going to look like here. And I appreciate you bringing that up in this context again. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is board goals. So last year, I think for the first time, the school board actually sat and worked through a series of goals that uh, four of you inherited. And so this year, you uh, <laughs> this year you get to participate, and we're going to try to create a list of goals to accomplish during the coming school year, 2018-19. Uh, the description of those is posted in board book. Obviously, our biggest item is strategic plan. And so I'm not going to go through each of these because we've had discussions on them. But are there questions or comments, things people would like to add, subtract? Or are we uh, comfortable with what we've landed on so far? I just want to say I encourage people to, to look into them a little more. I think there's, there's been a lot of thought, and the order has a lot of thought into it as well with the strategic plan helping to, to set the direction for the district, measures of success being equally as important, not just where do we want to go, but how do we know that we're on the right path, closing the achievement gap, trying to, to function as a board in a way that we think better approaches what would be, be best for our, our direction, for the health of the trust between the board and the community. There's a lot of thought that goes into these board goals, and yeah, it's, a, it's a document that I'm very happy with and I hope a lot of people become aware of. All right, next on the agenda is policy updates, policies 101 and 102. Amir, do you have those updates for us? That's right, and these aren't terribly substantial. Um, part of the routine check as we're going through, 101 does take out a lot of the information about data requests and instead refers people to the policy, which is new, on data requests, policy 113, and then some other minor edits uh, policy 102, likewise, there's not a whole lot to it. It officially establishes the name of our school district and it has some minor um, grammar changes that we've been going through as we review these policies and getting them all uniform and consistent. We did not change the name of the district to Edina's Awesome Public Schools. Yes. Any comments, questions? Yeah. So the only question I have, which is rather mundane, is on policy 102, which says the name of the school district will be Edina Public Schools. And I know that that's the format we use, but query whether it, which should say the name of the school district is Edina Public Schools. Is, was, and always will be. <laughs> so that was a critical comment there. All right. Nothing else, let's go on to action items. The first action item is a uh, unrequested leave of action act. Unrequested leave, and can I get a motion to approve placing the teachers listed on unrequested leave of absence? So moved. So Sarah moved. All right. Gwen? Yes. Um, at this time, as I shared last month, at this time we do not have enough um, positions for two of our teachers, um, either because of the subject that they teach or for other reasons. And so we have um, asked that they are placed on unrequested leave of absence, which means that if we do end up getting positions that are in their field, 
then we're able to bring them back for employment, uh, for full employment, but at this time we're not able to. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Any questions? So this is a roll call. Sarah? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Uh, next, can I get a motion to approve the ISD 287 long-term facilities maintenance program budget and authorize the inclusion of our proportionate share in the district's application for long-term facility maintenance? So moved. And Margo. Good evening. Um, this is an annual process now since 2015 when the legislature um, had a change in uh, maintenance funding, deferred maintenance funding, to include a broader spectrum of school districts, including the intermediate 287. And so, um, as you can see in the attachments, their board has approved um, their 10-year long-term facility maintenance plan and then the proportionate share for each of the member districts. Um, and part of the requirement is that each individual board has to approve that, and um, then we send it back to 287. You will see our 10-year uh, plan um, funding request in uh, July. We still have a little bit more time yet, but um, 287 needs to get theirs done um, sooner because obviously other board meetings are impacted by that. So. Margo, I've got a question. I noticed that we're uh, pretty much flatlining. It's uh, we're, what our um, revenue commitment will be, uh, $450,000 basically. Um, no growth, no change at all. Uh, is that nominal? Is that adjusted dollars? Are you, I'm, I'm struck with your, the confidence we have that it's going to be uh, $450,000. So can you tell me which attachment you're looking I'm at? I'm looking at the long-term facility maintenance revenue application, 10-year expenditure. Uh, we've got estimated so, expenditures, health and safety, and we've got deferred capital expenditures and maintenance projections. So, yes, so this is for intermediate 287. Mm -hmm. And so it's their projections and then our portion. Oh, they're projecting for us. They're we, projecting for them. And then we just pay proportionate share based on our student population. Right, right. Um, there is the annual process. So um, what I can speak to is that we'll be doing ours on the revenue projection as well. And um, there is the annual process to update it. Um, it is based on students. But um, under current legislation, I would anticipate, I, I know their business manager pretty well that um, she know uh, that it's accurate. Have our numbers been pretty steady uh, in the last, say, 10 years to 287? Um, pretty consistent? So uh, our student population with uh, 287 is, uh, we have special ed students there, we have technical students there, um, some ALC students there. Um, so th that can vary from year to year, depending on the student need. So it doesn't swing wildly? wildly it's pretty it depends on the student need so it can swing okay okay thank you all right any other questions all those in favor of approving the isd 287 long-term facilities maintenance program budget and inclusion into their long-term facility maintenance revenue say aye. aye aye any opposed motion carried next we've got purchase of buses can I get a motion to approve the purchase of three buses from Hogland Bus Company? So moved. Second. Margo, you're up again. So as part of the capital uh, plan that uh, you approved as a board, uh, and we brought forward in January and you approved in February, is our annual bus purchase. And so um, we're bring, you, you've already approved the budget for it. Um, bringing back the actual uh, authority to purchase. Uh, we um, took quotes off of state contract and would recommend approval with Hogland Bus Company. And this is under budget. 
So was the approval of for four buses or three when we approved it? Uh, we reduced to three. Okay. Uh, the original, uh, when I reported in January, uh, was for four, and the request, uh, I think it was either at Finance and Facilities Committee or here at the full board, was uh, if we could scale back for one year, and so we did. Right, and that scaling back was because we had bought extra right. buses to prior. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. great. Any questions from any, anybody? <laughs> this is Oh, go ahead. On. I'm deferring. Okay, sure. All right, Matt, you're up. Okay, I'm up. Uh, quick question. So, just Margo, could you help explain that the number that was shown throughout the um, visuals related to start times always indicated kind of a fifty thousand dollar per bus price. So, with a two hundred and ninety three thousand dollar price for three buses with a trade in value, could you just help everybody understand what's operating? So, yeah. Uh, so that fifty thousand per bus price is the uh, operating, the driver, the diesel fuel, the repairs. The supplies, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. oil. <laughs> um, this is for the actual bus, the capital investment of the actual bus itself. And we have a large fleet, and we do need to have annual replacement of buses to replace our older buses. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks. All those in favor of approving the purchase of three buses from Hogland for two hundred ninety-three thousand and change, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next we have technology purchase. Can I get a motion to approve the continuation of the district's service agreement with Best Buy and to authorize the first purchase of 650 devices? Second. Steve. Good evening, Dr. Schultz, Edina board members. Technology is being used quite a bit in instruction. In order to have a orderly um, framework for how we leverage technology and in instruction, we've created a, the framework called eLearning Squared. It combines three major elements. That is the identification of where technology is, a, is an enhancer to instruction, provides the professional development for our staff and our parents and our students on the proper use and, and equitable use of that technology, and then finally ensuring that students have a device that are and they're equipped with a device in their classroom on a daily basis this um, agreement is a continuation with best buy that will be giving incoming sixth and ninth grade and new families an opportunity to purchase uh, technology personal technology at a significantly reduced cost um, the agreement is capped at a at a number so that it won't go over and initially we're starting off with 650 devices uh, purchase order for 650 devices. The quote is uh, in the uh, attachment along with the devices that we're offering and the amendment to the contract. Any questions? <clears throat> so, 750 devices? Or is it six? Right, so there's a question because <clears throat> the Recommendation is to approve a purchase order for 650, but then there's an, another reference to 750 Lenovo Chromebooks. So that, what, you, what are you seeking approval of? Right, uh, excuse me, then there's a second um, a bid that's out for the purchase of Chromebooks for our fifth grade um, schools. It's to refresh those, so I have it in two separate documents, I apologize. Uh, the second item is to refresh our fifth grade Chromebooks. Those, again, are devices that uh, students use in the classroom. Uh, the current ones are over four years old, and so we're refreshing those Chromebooks, recycling them, and putting the, uh, new ones in their place. We went out for bid for those on the following conditions. Cost, ability to deliver the product by June 15th, additional options that they would offer, and then relationship with the district. And if you look at the agreement, um, we had a number of vendors respond to it. The um, cheapest and the um, best uh, valued was Nortec. And so that's for uh, uh, asking that we approve that uh, bid for 750 Lenovo Chromebooks for the fifth grade classes. Okay, so that's gonna be a separate agreement. So let's Correct. go. Are there questions on the first agreement, which is <clears throat> an agreement with Best Buy for and authorizing the first 650. 
I just had one question for Steve. All of this is under our tech levy? Y yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Just a quick question. Do we get salvage value for the old computers that were uh, retiring? We continue to look for work through our policy on recycling and um, um, salvage of our devices. Generally speaking, we run them so there is really no value left on them. But what we do work is work with our vendors so we don't get charged recycling fee for those. And so most of the time it's a wash of them taking those away for us and not charging us for them. But we do, uh, when we do get, um, Per policy, if we, if we want, if we are going to sell those devices, we work through policy. But in the last three years, we really have used them right down to their very end. There's no really value left on those devices. Okay, thank you. I just have one quick question. Uh, contractually, is there ever a conversation around any advertising or collaborative relationship outside of the straight notebook? So for the first three months you use one, it logs on, you gotta watch a really cool 10 second Best Buy ad and it's another 20% offer. Is there any kind of conversation that we've had or could have with any of these partners? We could definitely entertain that. Uh, we do have to worry about privacy and data privacy and so we work very closely with uh, Best Buy to make sure that we're not uh, providing them any confidential student data or anything like that, or that we're limiting, uh, creating a wall between advertising um, with our third-party vendors. Uh, that works the same way with Best Buy as it does with Google, who we get a lot of services from. They can't advertise to our students. They can't push advertisement to our students as well. So we just need to be very cautious about doing that. Okay, because outside of data privacy, just conceptually as a revenue raising event, we've had discussions where parents come forward to the Finance and Facilities Committee and say, what if we did branding around the football field? What if we did it around swim? So I was just wondering if we can talk about this later and through strategic planning process and revenue generating activities, but to what extent if we were already doing something, if that was being done. So at this point, it's just a contractual discounted rate for bulk purchases. That's correct, but okay. I, I'm sure we could entertain that if there was a change in policy or a desire to do that by the district. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor of approving the continuation of the district services agreement with Best Buy and authorizing the first purchase for 650 devices, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Now I'd like a separate motion to approve the purchase of the 750 Lenovo Chromebooks. Motion, please. So Come. moved. Second. <laughs> and Steve, you already explained this one as part of the first, correct? That is correct. It's for the refresh of the fifth grade Chromebooks. Any questions? All those in favor of approving the purchase of 750 Lenovo Chromebooks, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next, can I get a motion to approve policy 903? So moved. Second. Second. Amir? Yeah, so this is back, and we have addressed some of the, the questions that come up before and hit pause on some of the others. The, for example, the question about parents Lenny, and texting and recognizing that that's how a lot of them communicate. There is a line in there about... Uh, about recognizing that will be done as mm -hmm. parents deem necessary. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are some other, some other significant changes, and there's going to be a, a change in, in tone with regard to the openness of the buildings as parents need to register and identify the, the make and model of your vehicle. And we're trying to balance that need for security with recognition that there are legitimate reasons for parents to want to come visit a class. We're asking that that be coordinated ahead of time and not a spur of the moment type uh, decision as far as the building is concerned. But we're trying to strike this balance. And there'll be an ongoing adjustment, and it'll be an iterative process, uh, especially since we're having walkthroughs done by police and fire as we get towards the fall. We'll get some recommendations from them and update this as well. There's been talk about being more clear about what's expected after hours, um, which we can come back to. And just in general, as we go towards a single entry point, we might find some more changes that need to be updated in policy. But we think it's important to get this off the ground because there are enough changes in here to put them into effect. Um, and from there, I guess, open up to other questions or discussion from the board. See, as I reread through this policy for tonight, um, I'm wondering if we're going to have any uh, training for staff in our front offices because 
I know currently I've never been asked in my how many years I've had kids in the district to sign my vehicle and license plate um, or oh, sorry but make and model so just some of these things are new so I'm wondering what training we're going to be doing for staff um, what type of form retention we're keeping with these types of things as we move forward so it's all part of this safety and security work we're doing um, with uh, police and fire and that'll be part of it as we have all the entrances across the district with one single entry point that will be part of it part of the training okay so yep. when they sign in we're gonna have new stuff that yep. they okay. right. right. thank you question um, I was a little confused if you look at D where it says the building principal or a designee will follow this policy in determining whether or not permission will be granted for a visit to a school building is that only as it relates to parents who wish to observe their children in the classroom or is that as it relates to any visitor coming to the school so the definition of a visitor are, are people who are not otherwise assigned as students or employees in that school and administrators have the authority to grant visitors access and so that would include parents but not just be limited to them so so if I'm like coming to volunteer since I have a student in the school do I have to get permission from the building principal yeah so that would be something that would be previously clear they'd be expecting you you would do the registration procedures and they just know that you're in the building it wouldn't be something like the uh, the principal's new desk is right at the door but it would be something that had gone through the administrators so go forward all school volunteers are going to have to get pre-approval from the principal or designee. or designee or designee I'm just trying to understand it because that's a huge shift in yeah it is a huge shift I think we're trying to strike that balance between knowing who's in the building and having having some support so it's not just the front office workers who are assigned to make decisions um, you know they're assigned to to follow through on this process but we shouldn't put the burden just on on them and then also recognizing that we want visitors in our school we want these volunteers we want special guests we want parents a lot of times and so trying to trying to make this this culture that we value work in an area where security needs to be tighter so then to your point Sarah from a communications perspective that's going to be a big one with like the PTOs and how they get volunteers and how they feed those volunteers to the principal and if someone shifts mm -hmm. out of a volunteer and gets a friend to come in and yeah. that's gonna be quite a process. I think the concern as I read the policy is just that, that we there's already a lot of work by our usually at least two staff person in, especially at the elementary building and then in the other great other buildings and I just want to make sure that they understand the policy and we're not overburdening them with responsibilities that you know are either unclear or or are difficult for them to to be able to perform I mean when we say things like principal or administrator that that I completely agree with Erica so I want us to make sure walk through these things potentially with some of our staff in the buildings and get some feedback from them as to how they currently do things and and how they see this being implemented just so that we can find a good balance between the policy and the safety needs obviously which is why we're doing this but also to not overburden and um, you know make them feel uncomfortable with having to make decisions about who is coming and not coming in the building so so I think that Val do you have a comment on this yes um, the school district has a volunteer program manager Karen Rorick she's if you look at her the volunteer policy she's the designated designee so she does background checks on volunteers that are coming in and out of the building works with different area PTOs and sends over a list and there's a sign-in process at each and every school so I think this dovetails pretty well with a process that's very well established in the buildings about so how every PTO member goes through the PTO members do not to go through the same process but any of our volunteers because the PTOs work hand in hand so there may be something that we can discuss but in terms of community members and uh, folks that do not have students in school as they volunteer there's a pretty established process 
You can look when you come in the buildings. Karen has worked with every admin and principal to have a sign-in process. So I think it, um, it, it dubbed, I mean, I, I don't think we're reinventing something because she is the designee to manage the volunteers for our district. I think the so. more of the issue is with parent volunteers and yeah. if we're going to now require background checks on parent volunteers and the same rigor around parent volunteers, that's a completely different process. So the, vo vo the volunteer the policy that we have in place currently exempts parent volunteers if they're members of the PTO. So again, I think we might um, want to look at the intersects mm -hmm. a little bit just, just as, as we walk through this. Right. But and, and that's the point. Let's right. make mm -hmm. sure we get this clarified and train our staff properly so that they understand you know, what's being asked. And background checks are a separate step. Mm -hmm. It's not what we're talking about with this registration. And there are other exemptions for this registration as well. For example, school board meetings or polling place events or athletic or performance events conferences that are things that are limited to a part of the building a part of the time it's not going to be um, like it is on a typical school day for those types of things right because I mean, if you read the policy you, you question like the community center so what parts are public what parts aren't you know with our uh, district wing technically that door is left unlocked until four o'clock but can anybody just go down there so I think there's just little things we need to clarify and make sure that we understand what the process is because we don't have a secretary or, or an administrative person sitting at the entrance to the hallway to the administrative offices. So I think it's just clarifying. The language is good. It's just we need to clarify actual implementation. implementation. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I, I'll go, ahead. go ahead. You deferred me last time. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Go and well, um, I enjoyed having lunch with my kids at Highlands many times. And to my understanding of the language here, that will not inhibit parents having lunch with their children um, at lunchtime. So they, they check in. So we're not talking about that kind of lockdown that parents can't see their kids at lunch. Um, Amir, what are your? So I think there's room in here for administrators to, to ch start to challenge that culture. And I think that's going to have to be something that we go through as a district to find where that balance is. It certainly wouldn't be probably a spur of the moment thing, right? And I think there's, that's something that I value as well. And it's not something that's specifically called out and protected in here. It's one of the things that's left to the administrator's judgment. Matt? I'll just to make one quick comment, which is that I just wanted to mention and commend Steve Buettner and the team on what they're doing around safety. So a lot of these things aren't communicated with the overall community. We had a closed meeting last week on Monday with the entire board in here for a couple hours working with the administration to understand what's being done to keep all your kids safe. So these are all great questions and we're going to have to do a good job communicating around it. But culturally, we, we're not going to be able to meet both needs. The district can't to make no changes and keep your kids safe, period. So um, I'm asking for everyone to work together on this and realizing I'm not on policy so I don't have all the intricacies about the way it works but that is the overarching theme here is how do we keep all the kids safe and there was a discussion about that during the comment period so uh, th there might be some sticking points at the beginning of this from a process perspective but that's the lens that's being put over all of this and teachers and all staff safe all right any other questions all those in favor of approving policy 903 say aye Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next, we have our fees. Can I get a motion to approve the fees for the 2018-19 school year for fine arts activities and athletics? So moved. Second. So a couple of people had, somebody had a question on this? I did. I had two questions. One was I was wondering if the fees were all raised at a certain consistent percentage or were certain fees raised more than other fees? Was it just they were all raised like 10% or? It wasn't I'm actually on SAC, so there was quite a long discussion about where to raise fees and not raise fees and there were even decisions about, um, there was talk of like Saturday busing to sports 
right now that we do that for kids, but there's districts who've decided, well, that we can't afford that, so we're gonna cut Saturday busing, and then you're putting kids into the hands of either their friends or parents, or, and then you create inequities. So um, the fees, I wouldn't say were 100% consistent, but each department got to take a look at where they wanted to apply those increases and, and, uh, and choices in what they wanted to cut or not cut. But overall, there was definitely looking at trying to make sure things were level, looking at other districts in terms of like uh, theater or, or music or an athletic um, to try to make sure that things were consistent. And that was my second question is, does this put us above other Lake Conference schools or at par or average? At Finance and Facilities Committee meeting, the uh, um, Troy was there presenting to us and did provide uh, comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, the recommendation, while I don't have all that data right in front of me, was to keep yeah. us consistent totally. um, overall with the Lake Conference. Okay. Yeah. And it was interesting because some districts at the, what, was it Hopkins, where like the fees are just the fee. Doesn't matter what activity it was. One of the districts does it that way, whereas others, including Edina, you know, base it on the different activity. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I just had one quick comment. I'm on finance and facilities uh, as well. So, one thing that was mentioned and asked was that fees obviously are things that we're working with and trying to make sure is look at the overall budget and can provide all the services we want in the classroom that have been adjusted a bit. Someone's here very close to Give and Go. So I wanted to say that there are opportunities like with Give and Go and other organizations in Edina to help students and parents with covering those costs. So I wanted to make sure that's front of mind. So if this, this hits your family or those that you know, Give and Go and other resources are there. And we have been talking with uh, community partners who are doing wonderful work to try to make sure we can cover those changes. And there was a discussion during the Finance Committee meeting about uh, the future, in the future, when something like this is brought forward, that there would be some look into how the fees are, have been historically placed on different activities mm -hmm. and what, the, what is equitable, what is fair, what is um, appropriate. Um, so looking into all of those things, not just saying, well, historically they were X and now they're going to be 10 plus X. You know, it's, it's not, um, that is not the way that we wanted to review them going forward. So, um, because I don't think, it, just to speak to yours, uh, certain, certain sports were um, hit harder than others. And I, I, I don't know why. So we had actually asked that they take a look at that now proactively as opposed to waiting till the next time that there is an issue so that we perhaps adjustments could be made even if there isn't a need to uh, increase them. It might be a reallocation. So that we had, had directed a proactive approach at the moment. Any other questions? All those in favor of approving the fees for the 2018-19 school year for fine arts, activities, and athletics participation, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Um, are there any announcements? No announcements. Uh, we have completed the agenda. Are there any objections to adjourning? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.